Okay, we are back in action for uh, reading a book. Um, I'm sorry I missed last week. Adult things happened. Because, um, yay, being an adult. It sucks. 100% do not recommend. Alright, so uh, still reading Dealing with Dragons. Last week we finished at chapter three. Last time we finished uh, chapter three and we're about to go into see chapter four. Um, the video is about to expire on Twitch but it is on YouTube. Um, so all, all of my past, all of my previous streams are on, are available on Twitch, on YouTube. So, yeah. Uh, getting into it. And this time I just, uh, froze the Sims attributes and just made her, uh, need static and have her sitting on a couch reading. So, um, I will be doing almost literally nothing with the sim. It's just background ambient, background visuals. Um, the ambience is from, amb is off of Ambient Mixer. The, it's a slithering common room sound. Create it is a user is a, it's a user created on Ambient Mixer. If anyone wants the link to that, I can provide for it for this particularly. There is a uh, wooden door slamming in the mix. I just mute that because it's distracting. So, on with the reading. Again, we're reading uh, Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. This is a God's 30 year old story. To be specific, 32. It was published in 1990. Or 31, rather. Yeah. What is math? Okay. So, starting back up with chapter 4, in which Kazul has a dinner party and Simmerine makes dessert. Simmerine watched Therindil go with feelings of great relief. Now she had at least a month to find a permanent way of discouraging the knights, for she was quite certain that Therindil would spread the news of her injury. She decided to put up her sign anyway, just in case, and after a little looking, she found a scrubby tree beside the path and hung the sign on it. On her way back to Kazul's cave, she noticed that two, the two pieces of the ledge were still invisible, and she was very careful about crossing them. She looked down once out of curiosity and was immediately sorry. She was not comfortable with the sight of her own feet firmly planted on nothing at all. With the sharp, spiky tops of spruce trees in full view from 50 feet below. Kazul arrived only a few minutes after Simmerine herself. Samarine was looking for some thread to mend her skirts, which had gotten torn and stained while she was climbing along the ledge, when she heard the unmistakable sounds of a dragon sliding into the main cave. Samarine, Kazul's voice called, Coming! Samarine called back, abandoning her search. She picked up her lamp and hurried out to greet Kazul. I'm glad to see you're still here, Kazul said mildly as Samarine came into the large cave. Morans was quite sure you'd run off with a knight or a wizard. I couldn't make out for certain which. Is Morans the yellow-green dragon who wanted to eat me? Samarine asked. Because if he is, he's just trying to make trouble. I'm 
well aware of that, Kazool said with a sigh that sent a burnt bread smell halfway across the cave. But things would be easier for me if you didn't provide him with any material to make trouble with. Exactly what happened? <sighs> well, Morwen came to visit this afternoon. Samarine began. We were talking about all the interruptions I've been having, and she suggested putting up a sign. She explained why she had gone to put up the sign herself, and told Kazool in detail about her meetings with the wizard, the dragon, and the prince. So Morwen was here, Kazool said. She sat back, and the scales on her tail rattled comfortably against the floor. That simplifies matters. Did you bring the sign back with you? No, I found a tree and, and hung it by the hat, Samarine said, still wondering what this was all about. In case Therindel doesn't tell everyone about my ankle after all. Better still, Kazul said and smiled fiercely, showing all her teeth. Moran's is going to regret meddling. Meddling in what? My business. I'd like a little I'd like a little more of an explanation than that, if you don't mind giving one. Samarine said with a touch of exasperation. Kazul looked startled, then thoughtful. Then she nodded. I keep forgetting that you're not as empty headed as most princesses, she said. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. This may take a while. Samarine found a rock and sat on it. Pardon me, throat is hurting. Samarine found a rock and sat on it. Kazul settled, settled into a more restful position, folded her wings neatly along her back, and began. It has to do with status. Dragons aren't required to have princesses, you see. Most of us don't. There are never enough to go around, and some of us prefer not to have to deal with the annoyances that come with them. Knights, Samarine guessed, among other things, Kazul said, nodding. So having a princess in residence has become a minor mark of high status among dragons. A minor mark? Kazul smiled. I'm afraid so. It's the equivalent of, oh, serving expensive imported fruit at dinner. It's a nice way of showing everyone how rich you are. But you could make just as big an impression by having some of those fancy pastries with smooth glazed icing and sponge sugar roses. I see. Samarine did see, though she found herself wishing that Kazul had found something else to compare it to. The talk of dinner reminded her too much of Moranz's repeated desire to eat her. Moranz is young and not very bright, I'm afraid, Kazul said, almost as if she had read Samarine's mind. He seems to have the mistaken impression that if a princess behaves badly, it reflects on the dragon who captured her. Possibly it comes from his inability to keep any of his own princesses for more than a week. Some of the lesser dragons were very snide about it when he lost his third and one in a row. I believe she sneaked out while he was napping. I don't see how he can blame his princesses, Samarine objected. I mean, if most princesses are unwilling, it must be fairly usual for them to try and get away. Of course, but Moran's doesn't see it that way. He's been trying to catch someone else's princesses in similar fa foolishness for years. And he's quite sure he's finally done so. He is undoubtedly spreading the story of your escape far and wide at this very minute. Oh dear, said Simarine. Kazul smiled again, and her teeth glittered silver in the lamplight. You'll look extremely foolish when it becomes obvious that you're still here, which is one reason I've asked a few of my friends to dinner tonight. You what? Simarine said. All her worries about Morant were instantly replaced by worries about fixing dinner on short notice for an unknown number of dragons. How many? What time will they be here? Where are we going to put them all? Six, around 8.30, in the banquet cave. 
and you won't be doing anything but dessert. I've already arranged for the rest of the meal. Arranged? With whom? Balamor the giantess. She's loaned me the cauldron of plenty that she uses when her twelve-headed son-in-law drops in for dinner unannounced. It'll handle the most things, but all it can produce in the way of dessert is burnt mint custard and sour cream and onion ice cream. Ugh, said Samarine. I see your problem. Exactly. Can you manage? Not if you want Cherry's Jubilee, Samarine said, frowning. I haven't got a pot large enough to make seven dragons worth of Cherry's Jubilee. Would chocolate mousse do? I can make two or three batches, and there should be time for all of them to chill if you're not starting until 8.30. Chocolate mousse will be fine, Kazul assured her. Come along, and I'll show you where, you, where to bring it. Chocolate mousse will be fine. Uh, yeah, anything is better than um, burnt mint custard. Sour cream and onion ice cream almost sounds good. But that's also because I simp for sweet and savory things at the same time. Um, I'm actually interested to see if I could potentially... <laughs> Seasonal allergies suck. Ugh. Okay, where was I? Oh, yeah. Simmerine picked up a lamp and followed Kazool's into the public tunnels that surrounded Kazool's private cave. She was a little surprised, but when she saw the size of the banquet cave, she understood it was enormous. Fifty or sixty dragons, perhaps even a hundred, perhaps even a hundred of them, would fit into it quite comfortably. <sighs> Obviously, it had to be a public room. There simply wasn't enough space for the, under the mountains of mourning for every dragon to have a cave this size. Kazul made sure Simmerine could find her way to the banquet cave without help, and then left her in the kitchen to melt slabs of chocolate and whip gallons of cream for the moose. By the time she finished, she was hot and tired, and all she really wanted to do was take a nap. <sighs> And Simmerine wasn't about to appear before all those dragons in her old clothes with sweaty straggles of hair sticking to her neck and a smear of chocolate across her nose. So instead of napping, she pumped a cauldron of water, heated it in the kitchen fire, and took a bath. I keep forgetting that my computer idles. If I don't mess with it. Okay. We're back in action. Once she was clean, she felt much better. She checked to make sure the moose was setting properly, then went into her own rooms to decide what she should wear. Unfortunately, she didn't have much she was afraid she didn't have much choice. The wardroom in her bedroom was full of neat, serviceable dresses suitable for cooking in or rummaging through treasure. But the only dressy clothes she had were the ones she had arrived in. She got them out of the back of the wardrobe and found to her dismay that the hem of the gown was badly stained with mud from her long walk. There was no time to clean it. She would have to wear one of the everyday dresses. <sighs> with a sigh, Simmerine turned back to the wardrobe and opened it once more to look for the nicest of ordinary gowns. She gasped in surprise. The hangers were now full of the most beautiful gowns she had ever seen. Some were silk, and some were velvet, some were heavy brocade, and some were layers of feather-light gauze. Some were embroidered with gold, and, gold or silver, and some were sewn with jewels. Well, of course, Simmerine said aloud after a stunned moment. Why would a dragon have an ordinary wardrobe? Of course it's magic. What's in it depends on what I'm looking for. One of the wardrobe doors waggled lightly, waggled slightly, and its hinges creaked in smug agreement. Simmerine blinked at her, blinked at it, then shook herself and began looking through the gowns. 
She chose one of red velvet, heavily embroidered with gold, and found matching slippers in the bottom of the obliging wardrobe. She let her black hair hang in loose waves near, nearly to her feet, and even dug her crown out of the back of the drawer where she'd stuffed it on her first night. She finished getting ready a few minutes early. Feeling fairly cheerful, she went to the kitchen to fetch the moose. It took Simmerine four trips to get the moose down to the serving area just off the banquet cave. A dragon-sized serving was a little over a bucketful, and she could barely manage to carry two at a time. When everything was ready, she stood at, in the serving area and waited nervously for Kazul to ring for dessert. She could hear the muffled booming of the dragon's voices through the heavy oak door but she could not make out what any of them were saying. The bell rang at last, summoning some marine to serve dessert. She carried the moose into the banquet cave cavern, two servings at a time, and set it in front of Kazul and her guests. The dragons were crouched around a shoulder sly slab of white stone. Shoulder high, what are words? Simmerine had to be very careful about lifting the moose up onto it. Fortunately, she didn't have to wonder which dragon to serve first. She could tell which dragons were most important from their places at the table, and she made a silent apology to her protocol teacher who had insisted that she learn about seating arrangements. Protocol had been one of princess, princess lessons Simmerine had hated most. As she set the last serving in front of Kazul, one of the other dragons made it, said in a disgruntled and vaguely familiar voice, I see the rumors are wrong again, Kazul. Or did you have to go after her and haul her back the way the rest of us do? The Simmerine turned angrily, but before she could say anything, a large gray-green dragon on the other side of the stone slab said, Nonsense, Warog. Girl's got more sense than that. She shouldn't, you shouldn't listen to gossip. Next thing you know, you'll be chasing after that imaginary wizard Karim spinned on about. Simmerun recognized the speaker at once. He was Roxim, the elderly dragon she had given four of her handkerchiefs to. I suppose it was that entry at Moran's again, trying to cause trouble. A purple green dragon said with bored distaste. Someone should do something about him. Kazul still hasn't answered my question, Warog said, and his tail lashed once like the tail of an angry cat. <laughs> and I'd like her to do so if, I, if the rest of you will stop sidetracking the conversation. Here now, Roxon said indignantly. That's a bit strong, Warog. Too strong, if you ask me. I didn't. Warog said. I asked Kazul, and I'm still waiting. I'm very pleased with my princess, Kazul said mildly, and no, I didn't have to haul her back as you would realize if you had given the matter a little thought. Or does your princess normally have seven servings of chocolate mousse in the kitchen, leave seven servings of chocolate mousse in the kitchen when she runs away? Hear, hear, Roxon said. Samarine so noticed with interest that Warog's scales had turned an even brighter shade of green than normal, and that he was starting to smell faintly of brimstone. One of these days you'll go too far, Kazul, he said. You started it, Kazul pointed out. She turned to the breed, to the gray dragon. Whatever your notification. Sorry, my phone went off. What's this about Garim and a wizard, Roxum? You haven't heard, Roxum said, sounding surprised. Garim's been raving about it for weeks. Someone snuck into her cave and stole a book from her library. No traces, but for some reason she's positive it was a wizard. Achoo! Roxum sneezed, emitting a small a ball of flame that just missed hitting his bowl of moose. Gives me an allergy attack just thinking about it. <sighs> if it wasn't a wizard, who was it? The dragon at the far end of the table asked. 
Could have been anybody. An elf, a dwarf, even a human. Roxham responded. No reason to think it was a wizard just because Garim didn't catch him in the act. Not with the amount of time she spends away from home. Which book did she lose? Said the thin brownish green dragon next to Kazul. What does it matter? The purple green dragon muttered. Some history or other. And that's another thing. Why would a, what would a wizard want with a history book? No, no, Garin's making a lot of fuss over a common thief, that's what I say. It could have been a wizard, said the dragon, dragon at the far end. Who knows why they want things, the things they want. Ridiculous, Roxon replied with vigor. A wizard wouldn't dare come through this part of the mountains. They know what we do to him by George. Beg pardon. He added to the silver-green dragon next to him, who appeared to have been rather shocked by his language. That always gets me. I'm afraid you're wrong there, Kazul said. Simarine met one today, less than a two-minute flight from my cave. What? What? Roxham said, You're sure? That's done it. The purple green dragon rolled his head in ir an irritated gesture, so that his scales made a scratching noise as they rubbed together. You'll never go to quit talking about it now. Quite sure. Quite sure. Simarine assured Roxham after glancing at Kazul to make sure she was expected to answer Roxham's question for herself. He made two bits of the ledge I was standing on turn invisible, so I would think it wasn't safe to keep going. Certainly sounds like a wizard to me, the dragon at the far end commented. What did he look like? asked the silver green dragon. Samarine so described the wizard as well as the as she could, then added he said his name was Zeminar. Zeminar? That's ridiculous. Warog snorted. Ziminar was elected head of the Society of Wizards last year. He wouldn't waste his time playing games with somebody's princess. Not unless he had a great deal to gain by it, the thin dragon said in a thoughtful tone. She turned her head and looked speculatively at Samarine. Such as, Rog said. He waited a moment, but no one answered. No, I can't believe it was Zeminar. The girls made a mistake, that's all. <sighs> Perhaps it wasn't him, Samarine said, holding on to her temper as hard as she could. I've never met Zeminar, so I wouldn't know. But that's who he said he was. And wouldn't it be amusing if she were right, the purple-green dragon said, showing some interest in the proceedings for the first time. I don't see that it matters. The silver green dragon said. The important thing is that he was a wizard, poking around smack in the middle of our mountains. What are we going to do about it? Toking tokos, Roxon said. It's his job to handle this sort of thing, isn't it? <sighs> what can tokos do about it? Warag said, and there was a faint undercurrent of contempt in his tone. He could use the king's crystal to find out what the wizards are really doing. The thin dragon said in a prim tone. He won't use the crystal for anything less than a full-fledged war. Warog said. And why should he? What could Tokos do even if he did find out some wizard was preying on poor defenseless dragons like Gara? Lodge a formal protest with the Society of Wizards, Roxon said promptly, ignoring Warog's sarcasm. Proper thing to do, no question. Then, the next time anyone sees a wizard... His voice trailed off and he snapped his teeth together suggestively. He'd probably just set up a committee, the purple green dragon said. Can't anyone think of something else? I don't think we have... We should do anything until we have some idea what Ziminar was after, said the thin dragon. It could be important. We have to do something, the silver dream dragon, 
Green Dragon said. Words are hard. Hello. Sorry, person in the chat. I get the feeling this is not showing any active viewers that they have already left. Things about me have difficult things about chat existing when I have my nose in a book. And where was I? Oh yeah. Her claws clashed against the stone table. We can't have wizards wandering in and out whenever they please. Why we lose half our magic in no time. Not to mention everyone sneezing themselves silly every time one of those dratted staffs gets too close added the dragon at the far end. The dragons began arguing amongst themselves about what to do and how best to do it. It reminded Simarine of the way her father's ministers argued. Everyone seemed to agree that something ought to be done about the wizards, but they each had a different idea about what was appropriate. Roxham insisted huffily that the only thing that to do was to inform the king, who would then make a formal protest. The thin dragon wanted to find out what the wizards were up to. She didn't say how this was to be done before anyone tried to chase them off. The silver green dragon wanted patrols sent out immediately to get any wizard who ventured into the mountains of mourning. Immediately to eat. Words are hard. Silver Green Dragon wanted patrols sent out immediately to eat. I guess she's still hungry. I guess they're still hungry. Any wizard who ventured into the mountains of mourning. The dragon at the far end of the table wanted to attack the headquarters of the Society of Wizards the following morning, and the purple green dragon thought it would be most entertaining to wait and see what the dis wizards did next. Warog was the only one of the guests who did not have a proposal, though he made occasional gr comments, usually sarcastic ones, about everyone else's suggestions. Highly suspect. Yes, the first time I read this, I was very suspicious of Warog. You'll see why. I was justified. Let's see. Kazul did not say anything at all. Samarun was at first surprised and then puzzled by her silence. Since Kazul was the one who set the whole discussion. <sighs> Pardon me. Who, set, who had set the whole discussion going to begin with. As the argument grew more heated, however, Samarine began to be glad that there was at least one dragon who present who was not involved in it. The dragon at the far end of the table was starting to breathe little tongues of fire at the purple-green dragon, and Roxon was threatening loudly to have another allergy attack. But Simarine was fairly sure that Kazul would stop the discussion before things got completely out of hand. She was right. A moment later, while the dragon at the far end was taking a deep breath to continue argu arguing, and the thin dragon was winding up a long, involved train of logical reasons why her proposal was the best, Kazul said, Thank you all for your advice. I'll certainly think about it before I decide what to do. What do you mean by that? The thin dragon asked suspiciously. It was my princess who met the, met the wizard, Kazul pointed out. Therefore, it is my decision whether to report the matter to the king, or to take some action of my own, or to ask for cooperation from some of you. None of the dra other dragons like appeared to like hearing this, but to Simarine's surprise, none of them gave Kazul any argument about it. 
The dragon at the far end of the table made a few half-hearted grumbles, but that was all. And the conversation turned to the intricacies of, sev of several draconian romances that were currently in progress. As soon as her guests appeared to have calmed down, Kuzul gave the signal for the empty moose dishes to be taken away. So Simmerine only heard a few incomprehensible snatches of the new conversation. She did not really mind. She had plenty to think about already. And, ugh. My eye. Ugh, my face. My mask acne. Ugh. Sorry, I just woke up a little while ago. Ugh. Okay. My glasses back on so I can see. Okay. Chapter 5, in which Simmerine receives a formal call from her companions in dire captivity. I hate these princesses. Kuzul slept late the following morning, and Simmerine was afraid that she would leave before Simmerine had a chance to ask about the dragon's after-dinner conversation. To her relief, Kuzul called her in as soon as she was thoroughly awake and asked Simmerine to bring in the brushes for cleaning her scales. What was that crystal your friend mentioned last night? Simmerine asked as she laid out the brushes. The one she thought King Tokos could use somehow to find the, what the wizards are doing? The king's crystal, Kazul said. It's one of the magical objects that belongs to the king of the dragons. But what does it do? And why did Warog think that King Tokos wouldn't want to use it? Using the crystal is difficult and tiring, and Tokos is getting old, Kazul replied. Zoroth was white to say that the crystal ought to be used, but it will take more evidence than we have right now to persuade the king of that. As to what it does, the crystal shows things that are happening in other times and places. It's useful, but it can be dif very difficult to interpret properly. Oh, a crystal ball. Simmerine said, nodding. She tapped Kazul's side, and the dragon bent her elbow so that the scales were easier to reach. The court wizard at Landerwall had one, but I had to stop my magic lessons before he got a chance to show me how to work it. The king's crystal is more like a plate, but the principle is the same, Kazul said. A crystal plate? Simmerine blinked. No wonder nobody talks about it that much. It just doesn't sound right. Kuzul shrugged. The king's crystal is much more accurate than an ordinary crystal ball. And if crystal plate sounds odd to most people, it means that few of them will try to steal it. Was that what the silver green dragon meant when he said that if the wizard started wandering through the mountains, you'd lose half your magic in no time? I never heard that wizards stole magic rings and swords and things. Not magic things, Kuzul said. Magic. Wizards steal magic. That's where their power comes from. How can a wizard steal magic, Simmerine said skeptically. She climbed on a stool and began working at the ribs of Kuzul's wings. Wizard staffs absorb magic from whatever happens to be nearby. Kuzul said, stretching out her left wing so Simmerine could get at the base. That's why they're always hanging around places like the Mountains of Mourning and the Enchanted Forest. The more magic there is in the area, the more their saps can soak up. What would happen if someone stole a wizard's staff? Would the wizard still be able to use it? The wizard wouldn't be able to work any magic until he got it back, Kuzul said. Most of them have a great many anti-theft spells on their staffs for exactly that reason. Of course, it happens anyway, now and again. 
And as long as the wizard and staff are separated, the staff doesn't absorb magic. Does that sound like a very good arrangement to me? Samarian said. I can think of half a dozen ways the staff could be lost or forgotten or stolen or something. It doesn't seem sensible for a wizard to depend so much on anything that's so easy to mislay. Kuzul shrugged. They seem to like it. I can see why you don't want them in your part of the mountains. Can you? Do you have any idea how unpleasant it is to have part of your essence sucked out of you without so much as a buy or leave? Not to mention the side effects. Side effects? Simmerine said, puzzled. There. Turn around so I'll do, and I'll do your other side. Roxim isn't the only dragon who's allergic to wizards. Kazul said dryly as she shifted her position, or rather, to their staffs. We all are. Roxum's just a little bit more sensitive than most. That's why we made the agreement with them in the first place. The dragons have an agreement with the wizards. Kazul nodded. To be precise, the king of the dragons has an agreement with the head of the society of wizards. The wizards stay out of our portions of the mountains of mourning, and we allow them partial access to the caves of fire and night. At least, that's the way it's supposed to work. King Tokos is getting old and forgetful, and lady, lately wizards have been turning up in all sorts of places they aren't supposed to be. Like that wizard seminar I met on the path. Samarine said, Do you think he really was the same Ziminar that's the head of the Society of Wizards? I doubt that anyone, even another wizard, would dare impersonate him. Kazul said, He has a nasty reputation. Samarine remembered the hard black eyes and sharp features of the wizard she had met. He had certainly looked nasty enough, even when he was pretending to be nice. He was sneaky, too, or he wouldn't have tried to trick her. And he had been very annoyed when Simmerine got off the ledge without his help. Simmerine frowned. I wonder what he wanted, really. She mused. Do you suppose he'll stop by the way he said he would? I almost wish he would try, Kuzul said. There was an angry glint in her eye, and her claws made a scratching sound against the stone floor of the cave as she flexed them. Don't wiggle, Simmerine said. If Ziminar is as tricky as everyone says, he won't come while you're here. He'll wait until you've gone somewhere and I'm alone. True, Kuzul frowned. Then she looked at Simmerine, and her eyes took on a speculative gleam. Speculative. Words are hard. Speculative gleam. He probably thinks you're as silly as most princesses, so he'll be hoping to trick you into giving him whatever it is he's after. And if he does, then maybe I can fool him instead, Simmerine finished. And once we know what he's after, we can decide what to do about it. Kuzul and Simmerine discussed this idea while Simmerine finished brushing the dragon's scales. There was very little they could do to prepare since they did not know when Ziminar might show up at the cave. <sighs> or what? Yeah. Or what he might do when he arrived. Then Kazul went off to inspect the ledge where Simarine had met the wizard to see whether bits of it were still invisible. <laughs> When Kazul had gone, Samarine went to the library to hunt through the books and s through all the books and scrolls of spells. The behavior of the dragons at dinner the previous evening had made a considerable impression on her, and she wanted to see if, whether she could find a way spell to fireproof herself. Until then, she realized what a that when a dragon lost his temper, he started breathing fire. Until then, she hadn't realized. Not that she was planning to do anything to irritate Kazul or any other dragons for that matter. But the dragons at dinner had been too annoyed to be careful. 
and she didn't want to get burned by accident, no matter how sorry the dragon might be afterwards. At first, Simarine didn't have much luck. She hadn't had time to do much organizing in the library, and most of the books and scrolls were lying in haphazard, dust-covered piles. Some had even fallen onto the floor, and there were spiders everywhere. Simarine realized that if she wanted to find anything, she was going to have to do some more cleaning first. With a sigh, she went to get a bucket of water, some cloths for washing and dusting, and a handkerchief to tie over her hair. She worked for several hours dusting books and manuscripts, wiping off the dirty bookshelves, and putting the books back in neat rows when the shelves were dry. She found two books and five odd scrolls that looked as if they might be interesting. These she set on one of the tables to look at later. She had just pulled a stained and yellowed stack of papers out of the back of the second-to-last bookshelf when she heard someone hallooing outside. Now what? She muttered crossly. She met, set the papers on the table at, with the rest of the books she was planning to look at later and went, to see, went out to see who was there. To her surprise, the noise was coming from the back entrance, not from the mouth of the cave. She hurried into the passage, rounding the corner, and found herself facing three beautiful, elegantly dressed princesses. They were all blonde and blue-eyed and slender, and several inches shorter than Zimmerine. The first one wore a gold crown set with diamonds, and her hair was the color of sun-ripened wheat. The second wore a silver crown set with sapphires, and her hair was the color of crystallized honey. The last wore a pearl-covered circlet, and her hair was the color of ripe apricots. They looked rather taken aback by the sight of Simarine in her dust-covered dress and kerchief. Oh, bother, Simarine said under her breath. Then she smiled her best smile and said, Welcome to the caves of the Dragon Gazool. May I help you with anything? We have made the perilous journey through the tunnels to see the Princess Simarine, newly come to these caverns, to comfort her and together bemoan our sad and sorry fates, the first princess said haughtily. Tell her we are here. I'm Simarine. Simarine said, I don't need comforting, and I'm not particularly sad or sorry to be here, but if you'd like to come in and have some tea, you're welcome to. <sighs> the first two princesses looked as if they would have liked to be startled and appalled by this announcement, but were much too well-bred to show that they what they were feeling. The princess with the pearl circlet looked surprised and rather intrigued, and she glanced hopefully at her companions. They ignored her, but after a moment the prin first princess said grandly, Very well, we, shall, we will join you then, and swept past the marine into the cave. The other princesses followed, the one with the pearl circlet giving Simarine a shy smile as she passed. Simarine, wondering what she had gotten herself into, brought up the rear. The princesses stopped when they reached the main cave, and the ones in gold and silver crowns looked a bit disgruntled. The one in the pearl circle circlet stared in unabashed amazement. My goodness, she said. You certainly do have a lot of room, a lot of space. Alianora, the gold gold crowned princess said sharply, and the princess with the pearl circlet flushed and subsided, looking unhappy. This way, Simarine said hastily and led the three princesses into the kitchen. Do sit down, she said, waving at the bench and beside the kitchen table. <laughs> The gold crowned princess looked at the bench with distaste, but after a moment she sat down. The other two followed her example. There was a brief silence while Simarine filled the copper tea kettle and hung it over the fire, 
And then the gold crown, crown princess said, I am remiss in my duties, for I have not yet told you who we are. I am the Princess Caridwell of the Kingdom of Roxwell, now captive of the dread dragon Gornul. This, she nodded toward the princess in the silver crown, is the Princess Halana of the Kingdom of Pornbuth, now captive of the dra dread dragon Zareth. And this, she waved at the girl in the pearl circlet, is the Princess Alianora of the Duchy of Toron Mosh, now prisoner of the dread dragon Warog. Pleased to meet you. I am Princess Simarine of the Kingdom of Limgerwal, now Princess of the Dragon Kazul. What sort of tea would you like? I have blackberry, ginger, chamomile, and gunpowder green. I am afraid I'll lose the last, use the last lapsang souchong this morning. Blackberry, please, Caridwell said. She gave Simarine a considering look. So you seem to be most philosophic about your fate. Would that I had so valiant a spirit. Halana <laughs> said in failing accents. But my sensibility is too great, I fear, for me to follow your example. If you don't like being a dragon's princess, why don't you escape? Simarine asked, remembering that Kazul had said that three princesses in a row had run away from the yellow-green dragon Morans. Curdwell and Helana looked shocked. Without being rescued, Helana faltered. Walk all that way with dragons and trolls and goodness knows what else hiding in the rocks. Ready to eat me? Oh, I couldn't. It isn't done, Curdwell said coldly. And I notice that you haven't tried it. But I'm enjoying being Kazul's princess, Simarine said cheerfully. I suppose I might have been upset if I had been carried off the way you were. But I can hardly complain as it is, can I? Alionora leaned forward. Then you really did volunteer to be Kazul's princess? Caridwell and Halana turned and stared at their companion. Where did you get that ridiculous notion, Alionora? Halana said. Warag said. Alionora faltered. You must have misunderstood, Curdwell said severely. No one volunteers to be a dragon's princess. It isn't done! On a side note, she reminds me of the, uh, Character Prudence from the from Disney's Cinderella's Cinderella direct to video sequels to and Cinderella two and Twist and, and three Twist in Time. It simply is done. <laughs> Actually, Alionor is quite right. Samarine said as she set up the teacups in front of her visitors. I did volunteer. She smiled sweetly at the thunderstruck expressions of the face of, on the faces of the two, first two princesses. I got tired of embroidery and etiquette. Curdwell and Halana seemed unsure of how to take this announcement, so they made polite conversation about the tea and asked some marine questions about the current fashions. Alionora didn't say very much, and the few times she tried, either Caridwell or Halana jumped on her. Samarine felt rather sorry for Alionora. The princess is swept off at last, still somewhat puzzled by Samarine's attitude. Samarine gave, gave a sigh of relief and set about cleaning up the kitchen. She was just rinsing the last of the cu cups when she heard someone hesitantly clearing her throat behind her. Simmerine turned and saw Eleonora standing timidly in the doorway. Hello again, Simmerine said. Did you forget something? Not exactly, Eleonora said. I mean, I told Caridwell I did, but actually I just wanted to get away from them for a while. I hope you don't mind. I don't mind at all as long as you don't expect more hospitality, Simmerine assured her. I have to get back 
to work on the library. What are you doing? Eleonora asked. She seemed really interested. So Samarine explained about the fireproofing spell. It sounds like a wonderful idea, Eleonora said when Samarine finished. The dragons are careful around us, but it would be nice to not have to depend on them not to lose their tempers. She hesitated. May I help? I don't think Azul would mind, Samarine said, but you'd better change clothes first. The library isn't very clean, I'm afraid. Eleonora looked down at her silk gown, which was embroidered heavily with silver and pearls, and giggled. Samarine took her to the bath bedroom and found a plain, serviceable cleaning dress in the magic wardrobe. It took two tries before the wardrobe figured out that she wanted a dress for someone else, but once it caught on, it provided a splendid selection in Eleonora's size. Then they went to the library and got to work. <laughs> Cleaning was much more enjoyable with Alianora for company. By the time they finished dusting and straightening the last bookcases, the two girls were fast friends, and Alianora was comfortable enough to ask Samarine straight out how it was that she had come to volunteer for a dragon. It's a long story, Samarine said, but Alianora insisted on hearing it. So Samarine told her and then asked how Alianora had happened to be carried off by Warog. To her surprise, Alianora flushed. I think it was the only thing left that my family could think of, that they could think of, she said not very clearly. My family, I mean. I don't understand, Samarine says. It's because I'm not a very satisfactory princess, Alianora said. I tried, I really did, but it started when the wicked witch, the wicked fairy came to my christening. She put a curse on you? No! She ate cake and ice cream until she nearly burst and danced with my Uncle Arthur until two in the morning and had a wonderful time. So she went home without cursing me, and Aunt Ermintrude says that there, that's where the whole problem started. Lots of princesses don't have christening curses, said Simmerine. Not if a wicked fairy comes to the christening. Simmerine Alianora said positively. And that was only the beginning. When I turned 16, Aunt Ermintrude sent me a gold spinning wheel for my birthday, and I sat down and spun. I didn't prick my finger or anything. Simmerine was beginning to see what Alianora was getting at. Well, if you didn't have a christening curse. So Aunt Ermintrude told Mama to put me in a spinning wheel in a room full of straw and have me spin it into gold, Eleonora went on. And I tried, but all I could man was manage was linen thread. And who ever heard of a princess who can spin straw into linen thread? It's a little unusual, certainly. Then they gave me a loaf of bread... Then they gave me a loaf of bread and told me to walk through the forest and give some to anyone who asked. I did exactly what they told me. And the second beggar woman was a fairy in disguise. But instead of saying that whenever I spoke, diamonds and roses would drop out, drop from my mouth, she said that since I was so kind, I would never have any problems with my teeth. Really? Did it work? Well, I haven't had toothache since I met her. I'd much rather have good teeth than have diamonds and roses drop out of my mouth whenever I said something, Samarine said. Think how uncomfortable it would be if you accidentally talked in your sleep. You'd be waking up rolling around on thorns and rocks. That never occurred to me, Eleonora said, much struck. Was that everything? Samarine asked. No. Eleonora said. Aunt Ermintrude persuaded one of her fairy friends to give me a gown and pair of glass slippers to go to a ball in the next kingdom over, and I broke one before I even got out of the castle. That's not so surprising, Samarine said. Glass slippers are for deserving merchant's daughters, not for princesses. Try telling Aunt Ermintrude that, Eleonora said. I think she was the one who found out that Warog was going to ravage a village just over the border and would be and arranged for me to go and visit on that right on the right day so I could be carried off. 
She didn't even warn me. I suppose she thought if I knew, I'd mess it up somehow. I don't think I would get along very well with your Aunt Ermintrude, Samarine commented thoughtfully. Well, it wasn't so bad, at least at first, Alianora said. Rog ignored me most of the time, especially after he found out I can't cook. And it was a real relief not to have Aunt Ermintrude around anymore. Only then Warnol brought Caridwell, and Sarath brought Holana, and... And they've been making life miserable for you ever since, Samarine finished. Why didn't you stand up to them? I tried, but you don't know what they're like, Alianora said, sighing. Caridwell goes on and on about correct behavior, and Alana dissolves into tears as soon as it looks like she's losing an argument. And they've both had dozens of knights and princes try to rescue them. I've only had two. How do you do it? Simarine asked. I've had nine already, and they're a dreadful nuisance. Alianor stared at Simarine, then began to giggle. What's so funny? What's so funny? Simarine demanded. Sorry, I was using the wrong voice. How do you... Caridwell bragged for a week because two knights and a prince tried to rescue her the first month she was here. Alionora explained between giggles. She said it was some kind of record. You've barely been with Kazul for four weeks and you've had nine? And you didn't even mention it when Caridwell was here. She's going to be furious when she finds out. If she wants them, she can have them, Samarine said, her expression grew thoughtful. Maybe they'd be easier to get rid of if I sent them along to another princess instead of just trying to get them to go home. Oh, Alianora said, said Alianora, and went off into gales of laughter again. Samarine gave her a questioning look. It's the idea of oh my being of Caridwell being oh my being rescued by a second hand knight. Oh dear. Eleanor gasped. Samarine's eyes began to dance. I could only take a good look I could take a good look at them first to make sure they're worthy of her before I sent them on, she suggested. This was too much for either of them, and they both collapsed in laughter. You wouldn't really, would you? Alionora said when they be when she began to recover. Send the knights to rescue someone else? I certainly would, Simarian said emphatically. I meant it when I said they're a nuisance. I wouldn't want to upset Caridwell, though. I'll have to think about the best way of handling it. It's a good thing they're Probably won't be any more of them for a few weeks. I should have plenty of time to figure something out. How do you know that? Alionora asked. So Marine explained about the sign and Therindel and her sprained ankle. Alionora was impressed and promised to help if she could. I'll tell Halana that you've twisted your ankle. I know she'll tell the next night that who comes to rescue her. And then it won't matter if your prince Therindel doesn't tell anybody. This settled, the two girls sat down and began looking through the books and scrolls so Marine had piled on the table. Alionora, having been brought up as a proper princess, despite the tiny size of her pro of her country, did not read Latin, so Simarine had to examine those scrolls herself. I know I said I was going to leave, ignore the sim, but... Trying to keep her cue full. Okay, where was I? Oh, yeah. There was a sizable sex of book 
sack of books left, however, and Alianora waded into them with a will. It was Cimmerine, however, who finally found the spell they were searching for. I think this is it, she said, looking up from an ancient crumpled scroll. Being a spell for, res for the resisting of heat and flames of all kinds, in particular those which are pr the product of magical beasts, she read. Yes, there's a list, and it includes dragons. I would think dragons would be at the top, Alionora said. Is it difficult? It doesn't look hard, Samarine said, studying the page. Some of the ingredients are pretty rare, but it says you only need them for the initial casting. After that, you can reactivate the spell just by throwing a pinch of dried feverfew into the air and reciting a couplet. That's not bad, Alianora said. She came around the table and peered over Cimmerine's shoulder at the faded ink. Is it Latin? No, it's just an ornate style of writing, Cimmerine assured her. It's not hard to read once you get the hang of it. See, there's the couplet. Power of water, wind, and earth turn the fire back to its birth. It's a variation on a dragon spell, Cimmerine added thoughtfully. How do you know that? Alionora asked. The court wizard at home mentioned it when he was teaching me mag magic. Cimmerine replied, studying the directions. Then maybe it really will work on dragon fire. Can we get all the ingredients for the initial casting? I think so, but it'll take a while, Cimmerine said. I don't have any wolf stain, and I'm not at all sure about unicorn water. Come on, let's check and see what we need what we need to get. They took the scroll into the kitchen and began hunting through the shelves and supplies. They found more of the ingredients than Cimmerine had expected, and she began to wonder whether one of Kazul's princess, previous princesses might have studied magic. They did not, however, find any wolf spain or unicorn water nor were they able to locate any white eagle feathers Alionora discovered a very cobwebby jar labeled powdered hen's teeth but it was quite empty Samarine made a list of the ingredients they still needed while Alionora changed back into her pearl embroidered dress Eleonora took a copy of the list and went back to her quarters, much excited to see whether she happened to have anything useful in the dusty, disused corners of her dragon's kitchen. Cimmerine doubted that she would find anything, but there was no harm in letting them look. As soon as Eleonora left, Cimmerine tidied up the kitchen and put it all but two of the books back on the shelves of the li in the library. One was the scroll of spells in which she had found the fireproofing spell which she wanted to take a more careful look at some of the other because she wanted to take a more careful look at some of the other charms and enchantments in, it described the other book was a fat volume bound in worn leather with the words historia draconum dracorum in cracked and flaking gold leaf on the cover Samarine had decided it was time she got Re that she really got to work on her Latin. Chapter 6 In which the wizards do some snooping and Cimmerine snoops back. For the next three weeks, Cimmerine spent most of her time free time studying the fireproofing spell and collecting the ingredients she would need to cast it. A few, like the wolfsbane and feverfew, she would gather herself from the herbs that grew on the, on the slopes of the mountain. She could gather. Alionora found a little jar of hippopotamus oil on, among the cosmetics left by her predecessor. The unicorn water Cimmerine got from Morwen after promising her a copy of the spell if it worked. She went to Gazul about the white eagle feathers, though she was a little afraid to explain what she wanted them for. She didn't want Gazul to think she was worried about Gazul losing her temper and accidentally roasting her. Fortunately, the dragon found the whole idea very interesting. It could be very useful, 
Kuzul said reflectively. There are enough hot-tempered tempered youngsters around that it would be well worth fireproofing the princesses who have to deal with them. I'm not sure I'd be able to fire. I'll be able to fireproof anyone at all," Samarine said. "I still need the white eagle feathers and the powdered hen's teeth, and nobody seems to have any." I'll see what I can do," Kuzul said. And a few days later, she dropped the bu a bundle of white feathers at the door of the kitchen. Half a feather was stuck to one of her bright claws, and another was caught between two of her teeth. And she looked very pleased with herself. Samarine decided not to ask any awkward questions. Even Kazul, however, could not find any hen's teeth. So Samarine had to keep putting off trying that spell. When she wasn't working on collecting the ingredients for the fireproofing spell, Samarine read the Historia Dracora. It was very difficult at first. After all, it was had been a long time since her last Latin le lesson. She kept working at it until she started to remember the right endings for the dissensions and conjugations and cases. Shortly after that, she realized that she was not having to look up as quite as many words as she had at the beginning. From then on, her progress was rapid. It helped that she found the book fascinating. Dragon history was not a subject commonly taught to princesses in Linderwall. But as she was now a dragon princess, she had personal reasons to be interested. Besides, the history of the dragons was very interesting. Excited. Sorry, glass slipped. Every page was full of descriptions of dragons ravaging villages, carrying off princesses, defeating knights and princesses, and occasionally def being defeated by them, and fighting with wizards, giants, and each other. When the book wasn't describing battles, it was describing famous dragons' hordes and peculiar draconian customs. Samarina so was in the library with the Historia Dracorum in front of her and her Latin dictionary on the table beside her left hand when she heard someone calling from the front of the cave. She had hoped it would at least be a little longer before the knights started coming back. So she couldn't help sighing as she stuck a leather bookmark in the book and closed it. Then she went out to argue with whoever it was. <sighs> Pardon me again. Until they went away. Two wizards were standing just outside the mouth of the cave. Samarine saw their wooden staffs first, before she was close enough to see their faces. As she came nearer, she recognized the one on the left as Ziminar. The one on the right was taller and younger, his brown hair and beard showing showed no trace of gray. His blue and brown robes were identical to the older wizard, except for the colors. His eyes were the same bright black as his companions. And he looked at Cimmerine in a way that made her feel uneasy. Good morning to you, Princess Cimmerine, Ziminar said. I thought I would take you up on your kind invitation to visit. I hope we haven't come at an inconvenient time. Not at all, Cimmerine said, thinking hard. She had promised Kazul that she would try to find out what Ziminar was after when he showed up. And here he was. Maybe if she convinced him that she was as silly as her sisters, she would be he would be careless enough to let something slip. I thought perhaps we might have it have since it took you so long to come out, Ziminar said mildly. But Simmerine thought there was a hint of suspicion in his eyes. I must not have heard you right away. Simmerine said, batting her eyes innocently, the way that her next youngest sister did whenever she had something did some, had done something particularly foolish. Kuzul has quite a large set of caves, and I was in one of back ones at the back. I'm so sorry. Ah, oh, Ziminar stroked his beard with his left hand. That would make difficult for you. Perhaps we could set up a spell for you, one that would let you know wherever anyone comes to visit. It would be more pleasant for visitors, too, if they didn't have to shout. 
What do you think, Antero? Like the one at the headquarters of the society, the, s the second wizard said, nodding. We could do it in two or three minutes right from here. It'd be easy. Zimmer shot a dark look at his companion. Simmerine was sure that he'd wanted to pretend he was inventing a difficult new spell so that he would have an excuse to wander around his old caves. Quite so, said Zimmer. Well, princess? Oh dear, I don't know, Simmerine said, doing her best to imitate the way her eldest sister behaved whenever anyone wanted her to, to decide anything. It sounds very nice, but Kazul is so picky about where things go and how things are done. No, I couldn't. I simply couldn't let you do anything like that without asking Kazul first. What a pity, Zimanar said. His companion coughed and shuffled his feet. Ah, uh, yes, allow me to present my son, Antarel. I hope you don't mind my bringing him along. Of course not. Marine said politely. I'm pleased to make the acquaintance of such a lovely princess, and Terrell said, bowing. Samarine blinked. This wasn't getting anywhere. Maybe if she brought them inside, they'd relax a little. Thank you, she said to Antarell. Why don't you come in and have some tea? We'd be delighted, Zimanar said quickly, if you'll lead the way, princess. This way. Simmerine said. She stopped just inside the mouth of the cave and gave the wizards her sweetest, most innocent smile. You can leave your staffs right here. Just lean them up against the wall. And Terrell looked considerably startled. And Ziminar frowned. Is this, too, something your dragon requires? He said. I don't know, Simmerine said, wrinkling up her forehead the way that her third from eldest sister did whenever she was puzzled, which was often. But they'll be so awkward in the kitchen, don't you think so? There's not very much room. We'll manage. Ziminar said. Simmerine hadn't really expected to get the wizards to let go of their staffs, but it had, it had been worth a try. She shrugged and smiled and led them on into the kitchen, where she made a point of bumping into the staffs or tripping over them every time she went by. Finally, Antarel turned his sideways and stuck it under the table. Ziminar hung on to his with a kind of grim, suspicious stubbornness that made Simmerine wonder whether she was fooling him at all with her pretended silliness. The wizards made uncomfortable conversation about the weather and the size of the kitchen for several minutes while Simmerine fixed the tea and poured it. Are the rest of Kuzul's caves this large? Zimanar asked as Simmerine handed his, him his teacup. She had given him one with a broken handle, even though he was a guest, because she didn't trust him. Yeah, um... From what I heard in some cult, in a lot of cultures, uh, if you give a guest a broken cup, it's a sign of distrust and bad luck. So good on Patricia for including that. Yes, Simmerine said. She was beginning to think whether think she was never going to find out anything. The two wizards seemed perfectly happy to sit at the kitchen table and talk about nothing whatever for hours. Remarkable, said Antrell in an admiring tone. You know, we wizards don't often get to see the inside of a dragon's cave. I'll bet you don't, thought Simmerine as she gave him a puzzled smile. That's too bad, she said aloud. Yes, it is, Ziminar said. Perhaps you'd be willing to show us around? Simmerine thought very rapidly. It was obvious that she wasn't going to learn anything if the wizards just sat at the kitchen table and drank tea. So she decided to take a chance. Well, she said in a doubtful tone, I suppose it would be all right as long as I don't take you into the treasure rooms. 
That's fine, Anturel said, a little too quickly. We won't, you won't touch anything, will you? Samarine said as they stood up. Kazul is so particular about where things are kept. Of course not, Zimonar said, smiling and sincerely. Simmerine smiled back and led the way out into the hall. She watched the wizards carefully as they sh she took them through the large main cave, the general storage caverns, and the big cavern where Kazul visited with other dragons. Zimonar made polite noises about the size and comfort of everything, but neither he nor Antrell seemed very interested. And this is the library. Samarine said, throwing the doors open. I am impressed. Zimonar said, and Samarine could tell that this time he meant it. She stepped sideways so that she could keep an eye on both of the wizards at the same time. A remarkable collection, Antarell commented. He began walking around the room, admiring the bookshelves and scanning the titles of the books. What's this? Zimonar said, bending over the table. The Historia Decorum. A surprising choice for light reading, princess. His eyes met Cimmerine's, and they were hard and bright and suspicious. Oh, I'm not reading it, Cimmerine said hastily, opening her eyes very wide. I just thought it would make the library look nicer to have a book or two sitting out on the table. More, more lived in. Zimonar nodded, looking relieved and faintly contemptuous. I think it works very well, princess, he said. Very well indeed. Very well. Then he looked over at the other side of the room and said sharply, Antarel, what are you doing? Simmerine turned her head in time to see Antarel put out a hand and deliberately tip several books off of one of the shelves. Stop that! She said, forgetting to sound silly. I'm very sorry, princess. Will you help me put them back where they belong? Simmerine had no choice but to go over and help him. It took several mere minutes to get everything back in place because Antrell kept dropping things. Simmerine was qu got quite annoyed with him and finally did it all herself. As she started to turn back to the center of the room, she caught a glimpse of Zim Ziminar hastily closing the Historia Dracorum. Simmerine pretended not to notice, but she made a mental note that he had been looking at something near the middle of the book. That was dreadfully careless of you, Simmerine said, frowning at Antro. Very clumsy, Zimonar agreed. I don't know what Kazul will say when she finds out about it, Simmerine went on. Really, it is too bad of you. I did ask you not to touch anything, you know. Yes, you did, Zimonar said, and I wouldn't like to think that we had gotten in gotten you in trouble. Perhaps it would be best if you didn't mention to Kazul that we were here at all. I suppose I could do that, Simran said in a doubtful tone. Of course you can, Antarell said encouragingly, and I'll come back in a few days to make sure everything's all right. I think it's time we were on our way, Zimonar said, giving his son a dark look. Thank you for showing us around, princess. Simmerine escorted them out of the cave and made sure that they had left, then hurried back to the library. She spent the next several hours poring over the middle parts of the Historia Jacorum, trying to figure out what Ziminar had been looking at. She was still there when Kazulf arrived home and called for her. That wizard Ziminar finally came, and he brought his son along with him, Simmerine said as she came out of the library. I know said Kazul, said, said Kazul. Her voice sounded a little thick, as if she had a cold. I could smell them the moment that she, I came in. Is that why you sound so odd? Samarine asked. You're not going to sneeze, are you? I don't think so. 
Don't worry about it. I'll have plenty of time to turn my head away. I wish I could get hold of some pin's teeth, Simarine said, frowning. That fireproofing spell. Have you looked in the treasure rooms? Kuzul asked. No, Simarine replied, startled. She remembered seeing a number of jars and bottles in various shapes and sizes when she had been organizing the treasure, and none of them had been labeled. I didn't think of it, and besides, it's your treasure. You're my princess, at least until someone rescues you or does I decide otherwise, Kazul pointed out. Go ahead and look, and if you find any hen's teeth, use them. Be careful when you're checking the jars, though. There are one or two with lead stoppers that shouldn't be opened. Lead stoppers, Serene said. I'll remember. Good. Now, what do those wizards want? I'm not sure. Samarine explained everything that had happened, including how she had seen Ziminar closing the book, history book as she turned, and how the wi two wizards had been perfectly willing to leave right after that. But just before they disappeared, Antorel said he might come back another time, Samarine concluded. So I don't know whether they found what they were looking for or not. Do you know which part of the Historia Decorum Ziminar was reading? Kazul asked. Somewhere in the middle. A little past my bookmark. I was just looking at it, Samarine replied. I was just looking at it when you came in. It's the part about how the dragons came to the mountains of mourning and settled into caves and chose a king. That's the section where the Historia describes the caves of fire night, isn't it? Kizzle said. Simmery nodded. There's a whole page about somebody finding a stone in the caves so that the dragons could pick the king. It didn't make much sense to me. Colin Stone, Kizzle said, nodding. We've used it to choose our king ever since the first time. When a king dies, all the dragons go to the Fort of Whispering Snakes in the Enchanted Forest and take turns trying to move Colin Stone from there to the Vanishing Mountain. The one that succeeds is the next king. What if there are two dragons strong enough to move it? Samarine asked curiously. It's not a matter of strength, Kazul said. Colin Stone isn't much larger than you are. Even a small dragon could carry that much weight twice around the enchanted forest without any trouble at all. But Colin Stone has an aura, a kind of vibration. When you carry it, you feel it you can feel it humming through your claws. And the humming gets stronger the farther you go until your bones are shaking. Most dragons have to drop it or be shaken to pieces. But there's always one who is suited for the stone. For the for that dragon, the stone's humming is just the pleasant buzz, so of course it's easy to get to the mountain, she mountain. You sound as if you had experience, Simmerine said. Of course, Kazul responded matter-of-factly. I was old enough to participate in the test when the last king died, she smiled reminiscently. I got farther than anyone expected me to, though I wasn't one of the top ten by any means. Simmerine tilted her head to one side, considering. I think I'm glad you didn't win. Oh, why is that? Kazul sounded amused. Because you wouldn't have any use for a princess if you were the queen of dragons. And if you hadn't decided to take me on, that yellow-green dragon Morans would have would probably have eaten me. Simmerine explained. You mean if I were the king of the dragons? Kuzul corrected her. Queen of the dragons is a dull job. But you're a female, Simmerine said. If you'd carried Colin's stone from the Fort of Whispering Snakes to the Vanishing Mountains, you'd have to be a queen, wouldn't you? No, of course not, Kuzul said. Queen of the dragons is a totally different job than king, and it's not one I'm particularly interested in. Most people aren't. I think the position's been vacant since Oron tore his wing and had to retire. But King Tokos is a male 
dragon, isn't he? Simmerine said. Yes, yes. But that has nothing to do with it. Kazul said a little hastily, testily. King is the name of the job. It doesn't matter who holds it. Simmerine stopped and thought for a moment. You mean that dragons don't care whether their king is male or female? The title is the same no matter who the ruler is. That's right. We like to keep things simple. Oh. Simmerine decided to return the, to the original topic of conversation before the dragon's simple ideas confused her any further. Why would the wizards be interested in Colin's stone if it's only used for picking out the king of the dragons. I doubt that they are, Kazul replied. However, Colin's stone was found in the caves of fire and night, and wizards have always been interested in the caves. But the dragons control most of them, and all the easy entrances are ours, so the wizards have never been able to find out as much as they would like. The Historia Dracorum is one of the few books that talks about the caves at all, and there aren't many copies. A wager seminar would have stolen it outright if he thought he could get away with it. I thought the wizard, the dragons let wizards into the caves of fire and night. Sermina objected. Why would Zeminar be poking through history books looking for information if he can just go and look at them whenever he wants to? We don't let the wizards, wizards visit the caves whenever they want, Kizul said. If we did, they'd be running, around, running in and out all the time, and nobody would be able to breathe without sneezing. No, they're limited to certain days and times. And if they want to visit the caves of fire and night otherwise, they have to use one of the entrances we don't control. Few of them try. The other ways of getting into the caves are very dangerous, even for wizards. Maybe they're looking for an easier way in. Hmm. Kozul did not seem to be paying much attention. He thought, she thought for a minute, then turned toward the cave mouth. I'm going to go see Garim. Roxham said a book had been stolen from her library, and I want to know which one. I'll be back in a few hours. I think I'll go look at the story of decorum again while you're gone, Simmerine said thoughtfully. If there is something useful in it about the cave's fire and night, maybe I can find it. Now that I know what I'm looking for. Simmerine spent the rest of the afternoon carefully translating the chapter that took, talked about the caves. She was disappointed to find that there was very little about the caves themselves, though there, though what was there was interesting. The book told how the dragons had discovered the back way into the caves and described some of the things they, found in, they had found in them. Caverns full of blue and green fire, pools of black liquid that would cast a cloud of darkness for 20 miles around it if you poured three drops on the ground. Walls made of crystal that multiplied every sound a thousandfold. Rocks that spurted fire when they were broken. Most of the rest of the chapter was about Colin's stone and how it was taken out of the caves by the first king of the dragons. Kazul returned just before dinner and she and Simmerine compared notes. Simmerine told Kazul what she had learned from the chapter on the Caves of Fire and Night, and then Kazul explained what she had learned from Garim. The stolen book was The Kings of the Dragons, and the entire first section was about Colin's stone in the Caves of Fire and Night, Kazul said. And only a wizard could have gotten past the spells and safeguards Garim puts on her library. And I think that settles it. The wizards are definitely collecting information about the Caves of Fire and Night. Then why do they keep looking at books of dragon history? Simmerine said. It seems like a roundabout way of finding out whatever it is, what it is they want to know. There isn't any, other way, isn't any other way to do it, Kazul said. Nobody but dragons has ever had much to do with the caves. 
And no one who has no one has written much about them except in Dragon Histories. Even the wizards weren't particularly interested in them until a few years ago, except as a reliable route into the Enchanted Forest. But from what I've been reading in the Historia Dracorum, the caves sound fascinating, Simmerine said. You mean to say that no one has ever written anything about the caves of fire and night except dragons? That's... Quizzle stopped suddenly and her eyes narrowed. No, that's not right. There was a rather rumpled scholar who talked his way into the caves a century or so back. And after he left, he wrote an extremely dry book about what he found there. I'd forgotten about him. Do you have a copy? Simmerine asked hopefully. No, but I don't think the Society of Wizards does e either. There weren't very many of them printed, and a lot of those were lost in a flood a few years ago, a few years later. Some hero or other shoved a giant into, lake, into a lake to drown him. The silly clunch didn't realize that if he put something that big in a, into a lake, the water would have to go somewhere. Well, that doesn't do us much good, Simmerine said. It's nice that the Society of Wizards doesn't have a copy of that book. But if we can't get hold of one either. I didn't say that, Kazul said. I don't have a copy myself, but I know who does. Who? Simmerine said impatiently. Morwood. I'm afraid you're not going to be able to work on that fireproofing spell of yours tomorrow. We're going to take a trip to the Enchanted Forest instead. And that is the end of the chapter, chapter and the end of this session. That was the end of chapter six. So, and there are tw uh, twelve chapters in this book, or fifteen. So that's if I continue reading three chapters a session a, a week, that's one, two, three more. And uh, by vote of my roommate. I am the next book I'm going to read instead of being the uh, second book in the deal in the dealing with dragons in the Enchanted Forest Chronicles. Um, I will be reading The Last Wish, which is a Witcher novel. Yeah. So that's going to be interesting. Um, though at the same time, I might take a break from pre-established and read one of my fan fictions. So we'll see. But um, tune in tomorrow for tomorrow evening for D and D with my me and some of my friends. Um, I am considering reopen, redoing my, reopening my, uh, Final Fantasy 15, 14 subscription, so I might do a little bit of that on the weekends, um, not sure, but, um, thank you for watching. If you enjoy my content, uh, follow the social links below and uh, donate to my Ko-fi or just drop a comment on my YouTube page, on one of the YouTube videos. Um, I will most likely, once I start getting more stuff nailed down be starting up a Patreon for uh, essentially as a startup to my upcoming Etsy shop I'll be selling uh, 
home crafts like candles, bath bombs, shower bombs, and some witchy things like um, embroidered, uh, sigil embroidered lap blankets and um, little uh, herb satchels. More updates on that uh, later. So yeah, see you next time and pace.